Uh, we're going to start the session. Um, I hope that you will enjoy um, enjoy the, the session that we put together this afternoon um, about necrotizing pancreatitis. We have some great speakers uh, from both Seattle and, and Canada. Um, and um, I just want to introduce uh, Dr. Simone Bergman from uh, McGill, uh, Dr. Scott Helton from uh, Virginia Mason here in Seattle, and Dr. Uh, John, John Sebastian Pelletier from, uh, from Canada as well. So um, we'll start the, uh, the first slide. So, um, so I'm going to talk with you today um, about the historical, kind of a, a big picture historical overview. I think that one of the things that uh, Dr. Bergman and I um, thought when we were putting together this uh, this this panel session was um, that so it's so important often to understand kind of historically where you've been, um, and so that you can kind of understand where you are and where you're going. And um, when I was, I know one of my mentors once said to me, "If you really want to understand a topic, it's it's so good to go um, look at look at the the history um, of the topic." So. Um, Today, I'm going to briefly kind of give you a history at a glance of, of um, necrotizing pancreatitis, um, briefly talk on the reclassification of acute pancreatitis, um, use of antibiotic prophylaxis, nutrition, sterile necrosis, um, look at the timing of intervention, and to briefly introduce some draining options, which um, then our other, our other speakers are going to uh, go into in much more depth. So um, history at a glance. Um, over the last 50 years, we've had um, a very significant uh, drop in mortality from this disease, um, from about 70% mortality to now um, less, than, less than about 20%. These are mainly due to improvements in ICU and supportive care, um, certainly from lessons that we learned from the Korean and Vietnam Wars, but also um, some uh, studies over the last uh, 30 years or so and the use of appropriate use of antibiotics for these patients, uh, inappropriate nutrition support, and all of these things, these three things combined have, have led to uh, the ability to delay our intervention, which has been a, a major contributed, com contributor to the drop in mortality, and certainly very significant advancements in technology. So, um, so just kind of looking at this um, over the years, in the 1950s, we see the introduction of the Seligender technique, then um, fiber optic uh, flexible endoscopy in the 1960s. Um, we all remember in the, in, um, in, the, in the 80s, we were doing, uh, there was the conventional approach, the uh, total pancreatectomies were often done in the first couple of days uh, that a patient presented to the ED, um, and then certainly the local lavage and marsupialization techniques for the for open uh, open surgery then moving on um, it back in in uh, some great work was done actually in, in Seattle in the, the late 80s um, using percutaneous drains uh, for, um, for drainage of severe, in, in drainage of this infected necrosis. Then um, we actually see the laparoscope introduced uh, to, the, to the, this problem. About this time um, when, cat, when we had a lot, of, a lot more CAT scans um, available, we have the, um, the Atlanta Symposium uh, done by Dr. Bradley in 1993, which introduced the original Atlanta uh, classification terms. Then um, down, then around the turn of the century, um, some, some of the uh, introduction of, um, of transgastric procedures, and then um, many, we, then we start seeing really the uh, pro proliferation of, of many minimally invasive um, things started getting introduced in a very major way. And again, through all of this, throughout all of these years, um, we continue to have improving ICU care, supportive care um, options, and things that we've learned, um, as well as uh, a, 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 that, are, that, are, that enable a further delay in, in the timing of surgery. Um, and so um, then again, in, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, we see the percutaneous necrosectomy approach introduced by the group in the UK, um, the, um, the videoscopic um, retroperitoneal debridement, and a lot of, and then again, a lot of proliferation of many different types of, um, of minimal access approaches. 
Um, and um, and then um, we get to the um, the Atlanta reclassification process. So project over the last 30 years, as we've learned more about this pro this uh, uh, this disease, we really came to realize that um, that we wanted a better way to classify the, the, the disease and talk about the disease, because what we were what was happening was that every patient that um, every patient that was infected was was called an, had an abscess, um, and any patient that had any kind of collection was called had had a, had a pseudocyst, and we now uh, with the new um, Atlanta reclassification pros, uh, project know that 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 that's not necessarily true. In fact, about ten percent of patients have pseudocysts, um, but most of the patients that we see um, actually do have necrotizing pancreatitis, and in the first four weeks, we call this acute necrotic collection, and um, after four weeks, we're now calling this walled-off necrosis. So the mostly what we're going to be talking about in this, this session today are going to be patients with walled-off necrosis. So what about um, antibiotic prophylax prophylaxis? Um, we all remember back in the 90s, um, uh, 1990s especially, there was, a, um, there was a lot of data that was coming out about the use of, of antibiotic prophylaxis uh, for patients. They hit the emergency room and they get started on imipenem um, for, um, you know, for, to prophylax against uh, infection development. And I think that we have actually, now there, there's a lot of really good evidence um, that really supports that routine antibiotic prophylaxis is no longer recommended um, for the prevention of infectious complications in these patients. And we really are, have moved more towards targeted therapy uh, for uh, kind of culture, uh, culture positives uh, patients. So what about nutrition? Um, I think that one of the we any I think we would all agree that uh, patients that um, that that have necrotizing pancreatitis one of the Achilles heels for the treatment of these patients is uh, the patient that can tolerate POs um, and uh, patients are often sent home being able to um, eat and drink small amounts of of uh, food. Um, but these patients that have necrotizing pancreatitis really have very substantial protein calorie needs, and and a lot of them need supplemental nutrition. Um, one of the another uh, very significant advance uh, that we've that we've made over the last thirty years is in the understanding of um, of how to support these patients nutritionally. Again, we remember back in the last century where uh, all these patients were were placed on TPN. And we actually, we now know that enteral tube feeding is, is um, uh, superior. This is um, supported by many, many studies, very high level evidence that um, enteral tube feeding as opposed to TPN not only decreases uh, infectious complications, decreases uh, the rate of multi-system organ failure, decreases the need for surgical intervention, and actually decreases mortality. So whenever possible, um, it's important to, if these patients need nutritional supplementation, um, to put them on some sort of enteral tube feeds, even if it's just trickle, trickle tube feeds. Uh, but feeding the gut is very important. Um, and we also know, um, I think with pretty, probably not as, um, not as, as high level evidence, but, um, but pretty good that we can actually um, administer the, these enteral feeds by NG tube or the NJ route um, if, a, if a gastric outlet obstruction isn't, isn't present. So what about sterile necrosis? Again, an area where um, we came from, an area where patients were getting total pancreatectomies uh, and the first couple of days of having presented to the emergency room with essentially probably sterile necrosis, most of them. Um, and, uh, and then we've moved away from trying to hold off on intervening in patients with sterile necrosis. We know from a very, um, a very nice study from the Netherlands uh, presented in um, 2011, 62% of the patients, they, they took this uh, series of patients with sterile necrosis and followed them. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a CAT scan from one patient. So you can see at 30 days, um, this uh, sterile necrosis, and this is, again, no intervention, just supportive care, that a lot of these patients um, can really be treated without any intervention. Um, st draining sterile collections 
um, can be dangerous. We know that the majority of, of the time these patients um, will get infected and that the, the infection um, development is really a, a, an iatrogenic one. So we're basically, we're giving these patients unnecessarily infection, uh, infectious complications sometimes. I think as a, a group, you know, SAGES, we're so focused on minimally invasive options. And I think that we need to, to remember that sometimes um, for these patients, the most minimally invasive option is actually patients. Um, uh, we, we as surgeons like to be in there, we like to be doing things and moving things forward. But um, in the treatment of, of this disease, um, we, patience is, is really, really is a virtue. And, um, and I think that we have to know, it's really important to know when to do something and when to do nothing. So as much as, as we need to kind of step back and be patient and uh, know when to do nothing, this is a, 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 um, a CAT scan of, of a recent patient of mine. Um, this patient did have sterile uh, Waldorf necrosis, and this patient is never, ever, uh, this patient is not going to be drainable with drains um, and is not going to kind of have their Waldorf necrosis uh, collections disappear like you did in that other CAT scan. This patient is going to need, uh, need, need, need some kind of, of surgical intervention. So um, let's now talk about the evolution of timing for intervention. We talked about how we've, over the last 50 years, have gone from intervening very early to later and later and later. Um, it's very interesting, you know, how history repeats itself in 1964. So at the time when we were intervening very early, uh, Kenneth Warren said, the most common errors in the surgical treatment of acute pancreatitis are to intervene too early in the course of the disease and do too much, or in the secondary and septic phase of the disease to intervene too late and do too little. And that is absolutely, uh, it, it is still, um, uh, that's an accurate statement today. So um, as we, um, as I showed you in those earlier, those first uh, couple of slides, we've been waiting, um, delaying our intervention later and later and later. I think the current, um, the, the current thought is trying to delay intervention for infected wild left necrosis to um, some, sometime around the, at least four weeks or sometime after the four weeks. Um, it's a, I think it's kind of a general rule that can then you can make exceptions uh, to for different reasons. And looking at the, um, the graph over on the right uh, hand of the screen, uh, was a study uh, published by uh, Mark Besselink, and you can see how the mortality um, drops as we are able to delay intervention later and later. There are a couple of reasons for this. Number one, um, the patient, uh, the SERS response kind of settles down as we, uh, as we wait um, um, during that time. And certainly the, the tissue demarcation, so basically what I, the way that I like to think of it is that the tissue decides whether it's going to live or die. And if it's dead, it's not as well vascularized. And so then when you do intervene, whether surgically or otherwise, um, it's, it's uh, less friable. Um, certainly the wall encapsulates, which is a very important issue when you're talking about uh, transgastric approaches. And certainly um, we see uh, complications substantially um, reduce. So um, looking at, um, this is, the, this is, this is a, the same patient, and you can see T minus, uh, happened to have a CAT scan, T minus one day before they developed necrotizing pancreatitis, four days, 30 days, and 48 days. So you can see how the inflammation and all the, the edema kind of goes away and how that wall uh, really develops over time. Um, so let's just talk uh, briefly about uh, some drainage options uh, for infected Waldorf necrosis. Um, and I'm not going to talk specifically about this because our other two panelists are going to be are going to hit on this um, kind of in, in much more detail. But I, I did want to address the issue. I think one of the, the we made some great progress in answering the question. Not only uh, do is um, do we have the options of the minimally invasive um, approaches, but is it really do we know yet that it's actually better or preferable to um, to open. And so basically looking at open necrosectomy versus minimally invasive options, and um, I'm not going to 
that you can see that there's a different ways that we can approach these collections, different kind of scopes, and you know, there's probably over 10 permutations, a combination of diff different, different approaches for, um, for these. But um, we do actually have very high level evidence at this point that, um, that, that minimally in and minimally invasive approaches uh, for infected wild lap necrosis is actually preferable. And I can even say that it's the new standard. So number one, we have the, um, the randomized controlled panther trial um, from the Netherlands, which, it, which randomized patients to a step up approach or open necrosectomy. And, um, and, and they demonstrated a reduction in the composite endpoint of death and major complications, long-term complications, and a significant reduction in healthcare costs. Um, the way that I like to think about um, a step-up approach is, um, is basically three Ds. Delay, we've already talked about um, the, the delaying intervention, uh, drain, um, and then debride. And so, um, uh, I, so another study that was just recently, we just recently published um, and really answered the question, again, is minimally invasive necrosectomy, this is surgical or endoscopic, the PANTHER trial just looked at surgical uh, step up, is it really better than open necrosectomy? And um, and so what we actually we actually just recently published these data. Um, it was an independent data meta analysis of of oh, about two hundred two thousand excuse me two thousand necrosectomy patients. So not two thousand pancreatitis patients, but two thousand patients from around the world that had uh, that had undergone necrosectomy of some sort, either open endoscopic or surgical. And, um, and looked at the prior primary endpoint was, was in, in hospital death. Uh, the, um, you can see just some highlights, the um, very high Apache scores, Apache 2 scores, um, and the majority of these patients, 75% of them, um, had uh, culture-proven um, infected necrosis. And um, what we see is that um, the top, um, the top uh, uh, section that the minimally invasive surgical necrosectomy uh, definitely better than uh, fares better than um, the open open necrosectomy and at the bottom the endoscopic again um, clearly uh, better than ne open necrosectomy. So our, our conclusion among severely ill patients with necrotizing pancreatitis, minimally invasive necrosectomy, surgical or endoscopic, is associated with lower de death rates um, than open necrosectomy. Um, and I think that this is really an important, uh, this is important, I, I really feel that the data now is, is, is firmly established enough that we can really say that in 2018, um, the new standard is to be performing some type of step up to minimally invasive necrosectomy um, in our patients. So in summary, um, I, we talked a little bit about the importance of, the, uh, of, of using the revised Atlanta classification for communication. Um, I think no antibiotic prophylaxis is, the, is I think, uh, very strongly supported by the evidence. Um, the use of enteral tube feeding over TPN whenever, uh, whenever supplemental nutrition is uh, necessary. Try to leave sterile necrosis alone whenever you can, at least uh, in the early days. Um, because a lot of patients will um, resolve on their own. Avoid early interventions in the first couple of weeks. Um, delay necrosectomy to uh, greater than four weeks. And, um, and I think that the use of step up to minimally invasive approaches is, um, is definitely associated with lower mortality rates and therefore I think is the new standard. So um, thank you um, very much. And